Well, I love it when we get together. I love it when we can come back together. I love it when we can gather in this place. I do love it that we have people joining us from whatever place. And so wherever you're connecting with us today online, we're glad that you're connecting. But you know what? I would love it if you would just gather together with us in this place. And then we could invite Jesus to fulfill his promise that where two or three gather in his name, that he would be in our midst. And so we welcome him today, even as we welcome each one of you. If this is your first time with us, thank you so much for being here. Can I just remind you of one of the promises Jesus made? He said, I'm telling you these things so that in me, you might have peace. In the world, you're going to have all kinds of troubles. But cheer up. Take courage. Find hope. I have overcome the world. That gives me hope. That's why I like to come here. Because we're a people of hope that lift up that promise and uh, invite God to make himself known to us today. Well, uh, the joke goes like this. Ask a fish, how's the water? And the fish says, what's water? (laughs) Think about it. Oblivious to its own surroundings, uh, unaware of the sea, the very sea it's swimming in. And the point of the joke is this, that human beings, you and I, can be so like that fish, just unaware of uh, the very sea we swim in, of the ethos of our environment, of the culture that is defining our experience. It's like in the, uh, the people in the Matrix If you remember that movie, just like cluelessly unaware of the true nature of their existence as they're just going through the motions and missing out on the much more that life could be and mean. Well, Acts chapter 17 is where we are turning today. And as we do, it's going to give us a submarine in the water view of the sea that uh, Paul was swimming in as he was in his mission, his life mission 2.0. He's, he, the, uh, the sea he is very aware of, but it is taking on deep and powerful new meaning because of Jesus' call on his life. Now, so far... We've seen him and his team follow God's call even as God was closing doors on them and then opening new doors. Um, Led him to the Roman colony of Philippi, which God's good news impacted. I mean, he really shook some things up, even used a, a real earthquake to do it. But today, as he pulls back the curtain for us, We're invited not to visit a Roman colony this week, but a Jewish environment. Two Jewish scenarios in two different towns. Acts chapter 17, first one is Thessalonica, and the second one is Berea. And both of them have some very telling contrasts that we're supposed to pick up on. So Acts chapter 17, I'm going to start the story in verse 1. When they passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, then they came to Thessalonica. And there was a Jewish synagogue there. And as was his custom... Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that Christ had to suffer. Now, that's not a word we like, but that was the gist of his message to them. Christ had to suffer and then rise from the dead. We've been singing about that already today. And then he said this, this Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. And some of the Jews were persuaded And they joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and not a few prominent women. Well, last week, when the gospel first came to Europe, the first convert that we were noting was an affluent businesswoman in Philippi, a town also known as Little Rome. You know, in Miami, we have Little Havana, we got Little Haiti. Philippi was like Little Rome. Now, now, this day, we are 100 miles further down the Roman road, the Via Ignacia, and in Thessalonica, capital city of the province and one of the most wealthy and influential 
cities in Macedonia. So it's no surprise that, when, that Paul would reach a group of socially prominent citizens because the whole city was full of socially prominence. And it was on a main crossroad that had a port at the head of the Gulf into the region. Now, unlike Philippi, it had a large enough Jewish population to support a synagogue. And it was, Luke says, this was Paul's custom. If it was the Sabbath day, he always went to the synagogue. So weekly worship is a good habit. This is what, what I enjoy coming here together. But Paul wasn't only going to worship and be encouraged. He was going as a part of his life mission. And then what he did in Thessalonica, he tells us, is three weeks in a row. And what we want to do is look at those encounters. What he did was reason from the scriptures, Luke says. So these are Bible study discussions that he's having. If you've ever wondered... Where do we come up with the idea to study the Bible when we go to church? Well, it's all through the scripture. And the psalm says, your word is a lamp to my feet. So we're hoping that God's truth will light the way. It is a uh, light on my path. And believers have been doing this for millennia, literally. But note exactly what Paul was highlighting. What did he teach when he went to the synagogue? And this is where we pick up one of our first clues as to what sea is this Paul swimming in. He's explaining and proving that the Christ, the Jewish Messiah, had to suffer and then rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. So what he did when he came to the synagogue was share the Messiah in the person of Jesus Christ. But And here's the twist, not as triumphant military Messiah come to restore Jewish nationalism and politically put Israel back on top with their king on top of all other kings in the geopolitical world. That's what they had come to expect. And yet Paul shows that Christ, the Messiah, was doing something very different, something they didn't expect. This is like the fish in the water who didn't see the sea They were swimming in, and yet it was found all through their story, the story of the patriarchs and the prophets, the story of suffering, and then rising from the dead. In fact, Bible scholar N.T. Wright summarizes Paul's message in the synagogue in this way. Abraham, Exodus, David, exile. Isaiah, Psalms, Messiah. Abraham, Exodus, David, exile, Isaiah, Psalms, Messiah. Tracking a timeline through Scripture's revelation with Messiah having a shock ending that was unexpected. No one saw it coming. A crucified Christ. I mean, the most humiliating and brutal kind of death reserved for the worst kind of criminals not usually associated with anticipation for Messiah. And so what Paul does, and this is what happens in Thessalonica, he uses the story of ancient Israel and he tracks God's salvation plan for all people to become part of his family. And remember, if anybody was qualified to know the story, it would have been Paul, formerly named Saul. Probably his birth name was Saul, named after the first king of Israel tallest man in the land. Parents probably had big dreams when they named him Saul. And then he was raised as a rabbi. He was committed as a Pharisee. That's like God's Marines, not just a, you know, a rabbi, but the few, the proud, the, the ones who go all the way. And then he was tutored under Gamaliel, who was one of the outstanding leaders of the time, and then trained to be zealous, active to the point of violence to make his truth be known. And now he sees in Jesus the embodiment of the one God revealed to and through Israel for the world. So that framework of God's story had always been, had always been a part of his truth, and it had always ended with Messiah, but what they didn't see, like that proverbial fish in the water, what's water? was that Messiah would also suffer. I don't suppose they liked hearing about it any more than we do. Suffering, that is. But he takes us through. So let me just do a quick run there. 
If we had been in synagogue on Sabbath in Thessalonica, what would we have heard? Perhaps this, that Paul would have taken us back to Abraham, the son of promise, Isaac, Abraham the father, who voluntarily offered up his son on the altar in obedience to God's command. And uh, perhaps Paul would then point forward to that other almighty father who gave himself in his son on a cross and would say, now you know that happened 2,000 years before Christ ever came. And then move to the Exodus, Abraham Exodus, Exodus chapter 12, where the Hebrews, as a slave people, you remember this story, we're going to celebrate it a little bit later in communion today. They were a slave people, but they were delivered from their slavery through Passover, the blood of a spotless lamb on the doorposts that would cause the death angel to pass over them out of because of its suffering, sacrifice that provides a way through death. And that happened some 1,400 years before Christ. Okay, well then, Abraham, Exodus, David. David, King David, was promised an eternal kingdom that would never end. People were expecting that. And yet, Psalm 22, as other indicators along David's journey would show, says that that would come to pass through the suffering of the afflicted one. Psalm twenty two fourteen, 14. And that, that came to David 1,000 years before Christ. Of course, then the exile period, the exile experience, that comes like 600 years before Christ, but it came to them as the consequence of the people's rebellion. Just like Adam and Eve disobeyed God and were invited out of the garden. They lost their place in the garden. So Israel's disobedience in the promised land caused them to have to exit the land of promise and find their way into exile in Babylon for 70 years. And yet God, during that time, tells his, through his prophets again and again and again that Messiah is coming and he would be one who would rule, yes, but through suffering and sacrifice. And all through their history, not only is there a timeline of expectation, Abraham, Exodus, David, exile, Isaiah, Psalms, but all through their history, the message of, uh, of suffering. They were expecting a military leader to restore nationalism and conquer in God's name. What they didn't expect was the embodiment of sacrifice in Jesus. And I wanted to throw one other slide up. Uh, Chuck, if you can help me out here. All through their history, I want to show the map of where they were during that timeline. Um, their journey took them all over that place, but from 2000 to 1400 to 1000 to 600 to 30, God, wherever they went, the message would still remind them that Messiah is coming, but in every one of those stops, he also said, and Messiah would suffer, and Messiah will die, and Messiah will rise. So Paul opens the curtain, and it says he went to Thessalonica at the synagogue, and for three Sabbath days, explained from Scripture, proving that Christ had to suffer. This was like, no, 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 no. Messiah will probably make other people suffer so that Israel can get back on top. And yet he starts opening the scripture to say, let's look at the water, fellow fish, and see what the scripture really said. Isaiah chapter 53, 650 years before Jesus says this, he was despised. The Lord would return to Zion as a suffering servant Messiah. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering. He took our infirmities. He carried our sorrows. The punishment that brings us peace was upon him, and by his wounds, we're healed. He didn't come to inflict wounds, and establish power, he came to absorb wounds. And yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, how could this predictive word be any clearer? The gift of Christ's atonement on our behalf. 
It says, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. There's more to come after this happens, in other words. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life. What does that mean? The light of life. He's going to live again? Yeah. And resurrection will lead him to be satisfied by his knowledge My righteous servant will justify many. He will bear their iniquities. This is incredible. But can't you hear this Jewish rabbi who'd studied the scriptures all of his life, suddenly having it all come together in Jesus Christ, the scales fell from his eyes, and now wherever he goes, he wants everybody to know what all of those thousands of years of revelation have been pointing to this moment. And so what he's saying, he's showing them that what's there in the Bible is now here in Messiah Jesus. And that's his message. And he wants us to know the same thing today. The embodiment of sacrifice and servant, the embodiment of Torah and temple, the fulfiller of patriarchs and prophets, this new king of a new kingdom in a new way of showing us how to be human. And it's coming from God. It's God's way that enters into the suffering of our human experience but then transcends it, transforms it, and then invites us into the hope that that brings. So the people in Thessalonica, when they heard it, imagine hearing it for the very first time. It says they they heard it, they responded, they accepted it, and a large number of Greeks, there were Jews among them, but there were a large number of Greeks from the synagogue accepted the message. And then you know what happens? Jealousy creates resistance in some of the religious leaders disturbed about losing large numbers from their congregation. Of course, that never happens to preachers today. Thank God. But you know what? The leaders that are so concerned about losing these people, they don't argue about Paul's Bible study. They don't refute The Bible study, they're just jealous of his popularity with the people. So what do they do? Well, they create a distraction. They create a public disturbance. Verse 5, they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace. They formed a mob, started a riot in the city. That's not the first or last time that religious leaders have behaved poorly with less than honorable motives. But what exactly had Paul been successful doing? Let's just enter the story for a moment because the answer is he's not starting a new religion. He's not starting a new religion. What he's showing is how Jesus Christ makes total sense as the blossom of the old covenant now giving birth to the new covenant through the thousands of years of predictive word and illustration in the Hebrew Bible. And then what's interesting is Luke's gospel, chapter 24, starting at verse 25, we're told that Jesus Christ himself, after the resurrection, he's explaining the same thing to the disciples on the Emmaus Road. Here's what Jesus says. They're walking along. They don't know who he is. They're just talking about how some guy that they'd put their hopes in just got himself crucified and how everybody didn't understand what was going on. And then these are the words of Jesus. He says, how foolish How foolish you are. How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things? And then enter his glory. And then it says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scripture concerning himself. What's he doing? He's helping these fish see the water. And don't we all need help doing that? Because we just keep swimming along. And there's usually some predator behind us that keeps us swimming faster, you know. And so you just got to keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. But we don't want to slow down and think about it. But somebody needs to help us see the water. What water are you swimming in? Let's just call a brief little time out here. What story is giving definition to your life? Where were you born? Where did you grow up? What was your family like? How did they define what really mattered? What what values do you fight for? And why do you fight? Or do you fight? 
Or maybe you're fighting for it, but it's not really of the highest order of motives. That's what happens in the story here, you know. What water are you swimming in? Sometimes we need it explained more carefully for us to comprehend, don't we? And sometimes we just don't want to see. We, uh, we kind of like things the way they are. Change is disruptive. We'd rather just keep the status quo so we don't see the water. Sometimes we don't, we don't want to see because if you're in disagreement, you don't want to change. You just want to disagree. Or how about this one? Sometimes... Uh, if you're in disagreement, you don't want to change. It's just easier to create a fuss than it is to go for greater understanding. And create a fuss is what the opponents do in the story. They rush to Jason's house. They're in search of Paul and Silas to bring him out to the crowd. When they didn't find him, they dragged Jason. It was Jason's house. Jason and some of the brothers before the city officials. And they were shouting, these men who have caused trouble all over the world has now come here, and Jason welcomed them. Some commentators believe that Jason was actually sponsoring Paul at the synagogue, and that's why he kept him in his house. They were hosting the team in his house, and that's how the authorities show up at his house because they understood that that's where Paul was staying. And when they went there, they didn't find Paul. The opponents were misquoting Paul, actually, and his message. They, they were saying that he's defying Caesar, and he's promoting against the Roman emperor. He's lifting up this Jesus as king, which, of course, was true, but not in the way they were saying it. And so the city officials, the authorities, they hit the panic button. And uh, that throws everything into turmoil. And the riot is churning, and they make Jason, they take Jason, and they subject him to public humiliation, and then they make him post bond. And then somewhere in there, it's almost like, well, somebody had a moment's sanity so that they're, they're not beating him like what happened in the last city. Well, maybe we should just hit the pause button here for a second because one of the lessons here might be that the gospel is a free gift for everybody to receive, but if you participate in sharing it, it probably will cost you. If you're going to help somebody who helps somebody else come to follow Christ, it may cost you. Well, that night, Paul and Silas head out to Berea the believers didn't want them to be at risk, so they sent them on down. Another 50 miles down the road, and when they get there, guess what they do? They go to the synagogue, because that's his habit, right? He goes to the synagogue. Verse 11, Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians because they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures for themselves every day to see if what Paul said was true. Verse 22, what happened? Or verse 12, excuse me. Many of the Jews believed. At the synagogue. What's he telling them? Abraham, Exodus, David, exile, Isaiah, Psalms, Messiah. And then many of them believe, it says, and um, receive the message. As also did a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. Now, you know, Dr. Luke is a Greek. I bet he felt pretty good about seeing some of his kinsmen Entering into the faith alongside him. By the way, here's a site in Berea where some of those photos uh, of our group were taken. There was the site, but then there was also a coffee shop, and that was really a, so we had to stop in there for a little bit of a snack. Right after service, you can have some of that too if you want. Um, but here's the contrast in this tale of two cities. That's what we're seeing. Thessalonica, Berea. What's the contrast? Um, the Bereans follow up on the study Paul gave them, not with a riot and not with a dispute, but by researching it. Daily studies of their own, checking it out. So not just Sabbath day listening, but everyday learning. There's a takeaway too, I think. So it's great to gather together and hear a talk and to study scripture, but it's even better to research it out for yourself. And these Jewish synagogue members who were trusting Jesus as God's Messiah now see how he was triumphant through suffering and then overcoming death. Well, meanwhile, word gets back 50 miles down the road, back to Thessalonica, and the ones who were leading the fuss there, disruptors, go to Berea, and they stir up the opposition there. 
And so Paul and Silas head out. Timothy, or Silas and Timothy stay on, but Paul heads off toward Athens. And there's where we're going to hit the pause button again on the story. We're going to get off the the tour bus now and just see how does this intersect with us any more than we've already talked about. Well, maybe this is where we should start. It's a lesson of self-awareness. Every one of us, every one of us, every cult, live in a culture and swim in a sea of value, environment, and um, that, you, that you may not be conscious of. You ask a fish, what's water? And they say, what's water? Or how's the water? What's water? Because we're so busy just swimming in it that we don't always see what it is that we're living by. Every culture has a sea its fish swim in. No one is a blank slate when it comes to hearing from God. When God tries to bring his message through, sometimes what we have already decided it's going to say to us is where we get stuck and we get stopped. And then we don't see what's already there, which is what Paul was trying to help them see what's there so they could get into the fullness of what God was trying to say. So this first message, the first lesson might be one of self-awareness. Just what, what am I swimming in? What am I holding on to? It's just simply a self-assessment, a self-evaluation. I can't do that for you. I got to do it for me. I got my own blinders on that I got to ask the Lord, help me see what you see and help me understand more so that I could go farther. So that might be the first thing we're supposed to be asking here. What story of life have you been told? What story are you living out of regardless of what you tell yourself in your religious life? And here's the most important question. Are you willing to let God take you deeper in if that's where he would like for you to go? To be more like the Bereans than the religious leaders at Thessalonica, doing daily Bible searching, daily researching, digging it out, and then responding by faith, coming with humility and with curiosity instead of what my expectation was when I first came in. And perhaps we also need to say this, be becoming more aware of our prejudices along the way. We saw that in the Roman colony of Philippi for sure, and now we're seeing it from religious leaders to another religious leader who both are Jewish. So maybe we should just say, Lord, open my eyes to any prejudices in me, especially the ones that like to hide in religious clothes. So don't settle for superficial Bible lessons. That's what the Bereans are teaching me. Don't settle for superficial surface level. Be willing to get to the why behind the what before you substitute some other how in the way. And why does that matter? Because the devil knows how to quote the Bible. He's been doing it a long time. He used it, a superficial interpretation of it, to tempt Jesus and he still uses it in people's heads to keep them from following the full truth. So Jesus wants to take us into the new covenant that blossoms out of the fullness of the old covenant seed. And not only in what we do, but in how we do it. So don't settle for hearsay or for shouting matches. Fear is a great cover of distraction to take you off the main point of mission. So be like the Bereans, not the Thessalonians. And so here, do you see what we're being shown? We're actually being shown two ways of dealing with the Bible. You can either let noise, the noise of distraction pull you away and your busyness keep you just swimming right on by. And there's a whole lot of people who do that. You can let diversion of lesser and louder things keep distracting you and then miss the fullness of its messianic blessing, Jesus and your personal life. Or you can give it honest attention, devote yourself to digging deeper, and then experience the blessing that comes from the fullness of Messiah. Those are the two Jewish options here. God has been given the Bible to the Jewish people for all of their history, and some of them were saying, I'm going with the distraction, and those who stopped were entering into the devotion were now receiving the blessing of Messiah. The two options are still viable today. People take them every day. 
Some people come to the synagogue, then they exit, pursue their own swimming life, and then come back the next week, nothing ever changes. What sea are you swimming in today? In so many venues, there's so much noise in our culture. News media, social media, entertainment. I'm telling you, we got something to fill up every single moment of your life, every day of your life, until you look back and all of your life is gone because you've been able to fill it up with something else that distracts, that diverts, that... But the book of Proverbs says there's a way that seems right to a man, but it ends in death. We live in a world wired to distract. It's built for distraction, diversion, distortion. And you don't have to be a religious leader to dodge the truth. But religious leaders do it. Instead of digging deeper, that's in the story. You just float along with the current of culture. That's an option. Lots of people take it. Or you can be like the Bereans. You can reclaim your focus. You can choose to feed your faith. Jesus said, man doesn't live by bread alone, all the material accoutrements of life, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. God's word is a light to your path. It can show you the way. God's word will be like a sword of the spirit that you can use to slice with truth and overcome temptation and evil. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away. But my word will never pass away. But here's the thing. (laughs) The Hebrews had the word. The Israelites had the word. The Pharisees had the word. And missed Jesus. So how do you get Jesus? Well, you got to get into it, seeking and seeing what it says. And so, I mean, have you ever seen one of these? It's a DPV, a DPV, a diver propulsion vehicle. I have yet to take one of these. I want to. I'm going to. I know I will. I love to snorkel. I like swimming underwater, but I've never, I've always been jealous of being able to go without having to work so hard, you know? Get underwater, headlights, and it's taking me all the way in. If there were just some kind of technology that you could hold on to and it would take you on a deeper dive into the Bible, would you go there? Because there are technologies that help you do that. We actually employ them here at the church, like Uversion, the Christ Journey app can connect you to your version Bibles that are accurate, every language, every variety that you'd like to take, and even audio version. I listen to that every day. Truly, I listen to it every day. You can load this on your phone for free from us and you version right now and get those Bible apps that will take you every day deeper into Scripture. You say, well, what if I read something I don't understand? Well, that's why from time to time we say, well, then pick up the Life Application New International Version Bible. It was written with you in mind. You got questions? The scholars answer them in accessible ways right there at the bottom of the page on each page of that Bible. This is an excellent tool for you to have in your home that will assist you in answering those questions. Another thing you can do is get connected to a group so we don't make the journey alone. And one of the first on-ramps is something we call EDGE, that will introduce you to what the scripture says about evangelism, discipleship, generosity, and empowerment toward a fuller life. And as you're doing that, then I gotta encourage you to keep in mind as you're digging deeper, some of the times the scripture isn't just written as an answer book, it's written as a question book. And so as you're reading along, you're gonna have questions. Here's the three steps that we always encourage people to take when you open your Bible. Observation, interpretation, application. That means you just ask first, what does it say? Second, what does it mean? Third, what do I do? Ask the Holy Spirit to be your teacher. Remember that every verse has a context. What do its words mean in their grammatical context? What does the text mean in its historical context? And then the closer you can get to what it meant in its original context, the closer you will be able to bring the timeless truths into the context where you live, the sea that you swim in. But the most important thing is this. Remember that God just didn't give us a book. God gave us himself, and he gave us the book so that through the book we could get to know him in the person of his son, by the power of his spirit. 
or the way we say it around here, help you find and follow Christ. Would you pray with me? Thank you, Lord, for Paul's faithfulness to your word. Thank you, for Holy Spirit, for opening his eyes of understanding to see how it points us to Jesus as our Messiah. Thank you for the opportunity today of seeking to do the same thing. I just pray for my sisters and brothers, all that are gathered here listening, all that are connecting with us online, that you would help us see what we don't see yet and not to settle for simply where we've been, but to allow you to take us forward into where you would have us follow you, Lord. So Lord, for those of us in trouble, those of us facing challenge, those of us bearing burdens, may this day be a day of overcoming as we remember that you suffered, that we not bear our troubles alone. Would you invite him into your place of suffering right now? He knows you. He loves you. He desires to be with you. You can welcome him right now. And perhaps for some of us, you've been religious. You've tried in the past to find God. Hasn't seemed to work. But if today is a day where your heart is saying, hey, maybe this could be the next step, then I'm going to offer a prayer now that you can join me in to invite Jesus to come into your life. Jesus said, I'm standing at the door and I am knocking. And if you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. Lord Jesus, if that's you I'm hearing and you are knocking on my heart right now, I don't want to miss it. So I open the door of my life and I invite you to come in and to start opening my eyes, opening my understanding. Thank you for on the cross dying for my sins. Thank you for rising from the dead. Now I invite your spirit your living spirit to come alive in me and lead me as I make my prayer in your name. Now, our heads are still bowed just for a moment, but if you prayed that prayer with me and would let me ask God's blessing upon your next steps of faith, just raise your hand just for a moment quickly, would you? If you did it online, please let us know there. Yes, to my far left against the wall, God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Here close to the front in the middle, God bless you. I see, and then to my right, against the wall toward the door, amen. Lord Jesus, for every person whose hand I've seen and those that I haven't perhaps, but you do, we pray that this day would be a day of hope, of joy and healing, and we receive you as our Savior. In your name we pray, amen.